Uh, yes, my name is Jesse Matthews, and I am on staff here at Mercy Hill. I usually don't get to speak, but Tommy, Pastor Tommy is in Africa, so I get to today, which is great. Uh, let us dive in. I'd like to get our bearings. I like to do this from time to time. Where are we? Mercy Hill Church, which is in Bayview area, which is in Milwaukee, which is in Wisconsin, which is in United States, which is in North America, Western Hemisphere, planet Earth, solar system, Milky Way galaxy, universe, mind of God. It's that last part that a lot of people don't agree with. And yet, we the people of God, we see it as kind of self-evident that there is intelligent design to the universe. Everything really doesn't seem like a total accident. In the smallest of microbes, in the most macro of celestial planetary movements, we see God and his fingerprint. In the uh, illusion of the sun falling behind the earth that we stand on and the colors it happens to create in a sunset, we see the fingerprint of God, in language, in art, in family, in the fragility of the holding together of life on earth. If you study it, it's it's kind of terrifying. We see God at work. In friendship, procreation, history, we testify that we ultimately exist not just within some voidly space, but within the mind of God, the very mind of God, and he is sovereign over it all. And this is where we really are in this vapor of life. Colossians 1, it says, For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And this great designer has designed it, that you too have a mind of your own. Maybe not his best idea, I'm not sure. We are made in his image that we can imagine, that we can create. Our mind is not simply a place where synapses fire from, but we can think abstractly. We can reason. We have a volition beyond our own instinct. Meaning, we have choice, which is incredible that we're not simply automatons of biological sequencing. We are not the summation of our environment. We are morally responsible for what we, what we choose, which is different than animals. Like, some people own pet wolves. Did you know that? Yeah, that's true. Some people own pet wolves. And uh, sometimes the wolves, for whatever reason, they, they bite their owner. <laughs> And, uh, and I would say, who is the stupid one there? For the wolf, it's programming. Or have you seen uh, those videos of Russians that own pet bears? Maybe it's better that you haven't. Maybe don't Google pet bear Russia. The videos are insane. The whole time I'm watching it, it's like, dude, the, the programming of the bear is if hungry, then eat. That's it. There's no moral struggle there. We've seen the uh, gruesome documentary of the bear guy. Remember that? It's not good. It doesn't end well. Not that we always use it. We have a mind. We can choose. We have volition. We can actually transcend our animal instinct, so to speak. And it's a powerful thing, our mind. Our life is governed from it. All things are within the mind of God, so too does the playing out of your life happen within your very mind. What do I mean? Let's start with something like marriage. Pretty big deal, right? Your marriage? If you are married. Uh, Okay, so it happened in your mind first. It's an idea. That's right. If it endures, if it ends, it happens in your mind first. How's that? It's a bunch of really cool metaphysical things your marriage also, but if it ends, if it endures, it happens in your mind. If you decide that you really don't believe in the importance of the idea of the covenant you made, 
then it ends. It's an idea that you have the choice to adhere to and then to live out or not. Same with any role. Parent, son, granddaughter, uh, godmother, uncle. These are roles that we adhere to or not. You might be thinking, Jesse, being a parent is not an idea. My REM cycle was broken last night because my toddler had a nightmare of a marshmallow again. I get it. it. It is happening and it is physical. But you could choose to just not adhere to the idea of being a parent. You could choose to not care for your child when they need it. Some people go that way. A lot of people do. Sin and righteousness or the breaking away of the design of your creator isn't the problem. It's whatever happens in the battlefield of the mind that creates the room for the sin in the first place. Sin and righteous action happen first in your mind, meaning they happen before your action. The complacency, the apathy, the lack of fear, the bitterness, the cynicism, the broken picture of your identity, the crippling anxiety or worry, the pride or refusal to trust what, teacher, what uh, Scripture teaches over your own intuition. That happens first in the battlefield of your mind. In the battlefield of the mind, do we first suffer the crack of the armor? The room for the rebellion in the first place. 2 Corinthians 10. For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. We've been in the book of Philippians for a while as a church. Uh, There's so much great content here. I want to look at chapter 4 briefly. We're going to start in verse 4 of chapter 4 and go to just verse 9. Paul, the apostle, says, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. I want to stop here. This is a familiar passage, correct? Many of us in this room have heard this. The content that the Apostle Paul is purporting for our lives, let's just admit this is somewhat absurd. Don't be anxious about anything. Rejoice. How much? Always, all the time, rejoice. Rejoice. And don't be anxious about anything. Instead, go to God with thanksgiving as you continually in every situation pray to God. The Apostle Paul goes on in verse 7, and the, and the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. I want to read that verse 7 again. And the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So my heart and my mind get some sort of peace And it will transcend all understanding. I can't understand it. And it will guard the thing we are talking about, in part, the mind. Verse 8, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Key word here being think. Think about them. Paul says to think about these things. Verse 9, whatever you have learned or received, or heard from me, or seen in me, put into practice. So fill your mind with godly stuff. Put into practice what Paul did and taught. Paul says, do these things, and at the very end, and the peace, or sorry, and the God of peace will be with you. So the peace, in some way, is God, in some cool, mysterious way. Let's break this down a little bit. Uh, Rejoice in the Lord always. Don't be anxious about anything. In your life, for this to happen, it would have to be a miracle, right? For you to never be anxious. It's not natural. Do we all agree on that? It'd have to be a miracle, a work of the Lord. To rejoice always and not be anxious. To become that person with whom the praise of God is constantly on your lips and on your mind. To rejoice always. And some of you are that people because I know you. And you annoy your relatives. And you're always just like thinking and talking about the Lord. And it's awesome. 
Uh, the thankfulness for what God has done is your primary state in your life. Anxiousness is not a part of your day-to-day uh, because you really believe God's got it. You experience his sovereignty. There are hardships, but not worry. And you happily set your mind on righteousness. And the peace of God goes with you. And your friends and your family and your coworkers, they experience it. They see it. They feel it. It's a rare person, but I know them firsthand. Some of them are a part of this church family, you big weirdos. They mostly live in this mindset. I mean, there are, there are times where there's like footing that is lost and they, they, they lose it for a moment, but this describes their home state. And it is the handiwork of God. For the rest of us, it would also, people who have, us who have not experienced that on an ongoing basis, day to day, that's your pattern, that's your home state, it would also have to be a miracle of God. And this miracle is something that I believe God wants for us and that we're instructed to be and embody in Philippians 4. Okay, so how do we get this miraculous transformation? Romans 8. Let's go there for a moment. Romans 8, 5. Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. Those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their what? Their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind is governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the Spirit is life and it is peace. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. Let's revisit verse 6 really briefly. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. So peace is a promise that we have. And the peace happens, as it says in Romans 8, 6, it happens in our mind. It says the mind is governed, the mind governed by the Spirit is peace. The, a mind governed by the Spirit. It's almost symbiotic. I was talking to a, a community group that, uh, that, that meets at my house that I help to lead. I love talking to those guys. And uh, uh, some people were expressing real fear about like a full surrender to the Spirit of God. Like you can do whatever you want in my life. Because the Spirit of God is living. And I'm like, yeah, that's a little scary. It's pretty weird. And here we have Paul in Romans 8, 6, talking about how the Spirit can actually govern our mind, which is essentially guarding and governing the unfolding of my life. Which is really beautiful, which I want, as opposed to what Paul describes in Romans 7. I do not understand what I do, for what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. Let's recap. So, living out Philippians 4, being a Philippians 4 kind of person requires a miracle. That miracle is described, as described in the same passage of Philippians, is the peace of God which guards our mind. So how does that happen? How does that happen according to Romans 8? It is the Spirit of God taking governance of our mind so that we can live in accordance with the Spirit, so that we can live in the realm of the Spirit, so they can walk in step with the Spirit. Spiritual consistency. We can have our mind set on what the Spirit wants. And Romans 7 describes this automation. Because Paul makes it sound kind of automatic. Like, once it's happening, it just goes. Romans 7 describes this in the context of prayer. Like, what it's like to be in prayer if you're living this Spirit-filled life. Verse 26 of Romans 7 says, In the same way the Spirit helps us in our weakness, we do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. So this is all pretty strange of me to even talk about this. Because Scripture is saying, well, you can't really understand it. And it's not really philosophically nuanced here. I'm just going, God does a miracle, look it. And so there's this feeling of, all right, Jesse, so thanks for sharing. Thanks for plagiarizing Jesus and Paul. 
and now you can sit down. We should invite the worship band up, and we should just pray and ask for it to happen. Do you kind of feel that in this? Because it's like a mystery of God that I'm talking about here. I feel you. But I do, uh, in an effort to be a little bit practical this morning, while dealing with the esoteric infinite mysteries of God, I do uh, want to talk about how you might uh, receive an interaction with the Spirit, how you might take a serious step closer to receiving an encounter with the Spirit of God. Uh, it's not a guarantee. God is going to do whatever God wants to do. The Spirit is going to go whatever, wherever the Spirit wants to go. Uh, and that's a beautiful thing. But I will say the Spirit of God tends to work with surrendered people. The Spirit of God tends to work with surrendered, repentant people. God opposes the proud, and the enemy, the father of lies, just hates this when we get surrendered and repentant. James 4, submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. So for the rest of this teaching, what I'd like to do is just encourage you towards repentance, um, towards surrender, that you might open yourself up to whatever the Spirit of God wants to do today. Does that seem worth our time? Cool. Uh, so I'm going to do battle with you a little bit. I'm going to like reason with you in the battlefield of your mind. I'm going to come to your aid, uh, hopefully, in the battlefield of your mind, and you'll feel encouraged. And uh, I'm going to do three things. First, I'm going to urge you to repent and maintain a posture of real surrender. And uh, I'll do that by reasoning with you about repentance. Second, I want to encourage you, encourage you towards repentance. And I'm going to do this by uh, reading an email that I got from someone at church. And this is kind of an act of obedience for me. I don't even, I haven't even quite fully understood everything that this email holds. But it's someone in our, in our church that practices the gift of prophecy and is prayerful. And she just submitted it, and I, and I received it, and I read it, and I'm kind of like, cool, I don't really know what to do with that. And as I was preparing this teaching, I really felt like I should read this in the context of this teaching. So I'm going to do that. Uh, I think it will speak to a couple really specific people, but I don't really know uh, how that's going to work exactly. Thirdly, um, I'm going to uh, specifically remind you of the nature of forgiveness, the nature of divine forgiveness in Jesus, because um, the understanding we have in our minds concerning forgiveness can blockade repentance. And so I just want to review that, go over it, talk about that a little bit. So first, the urging. I'm going to urge you toward, towards repentance. This is straight from Romans. Um, I urge you, brothers and sisters, at this point I'm just, I'm just reading what Paul says. I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy... To offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. So far, starting in, uh, in, in, in verse 12, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, which we're going to do at the end here, we're going to look at and describe the nature of the forgiveness that we have in Jesus, to, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. And for many of us, that is a repentance. For you to be in a place where you're offering your body, your life, as a sacrifice unto God, that is a new way that is different from the norm, a turning from the norm. And this is where your effort, your personal volition your mind comes into play here. Because Paul is describing something in Romans and in Philippians, something that seems automatic, that it just happens. Like your mind is governed by the Spirit, your mind is governed by the flesh. But this is where uh, I believe that there is a moment of volition where we let the Spirit reign over us. It's not simply the spirit governing or the mind governing. There is a moment of choice we make in our mind to give the spirit authority to reign. 
Paul says this is your true and proper worship, to offer that. Do not conform to the pattern of this world. Just like Philippians 4, whatever is right and pure and lovely and true, conform your mind to those things, not the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And that is the work of God, to renew your mind, to transform it. We can't do that on our own. That is a work of God, to be transformed and renewed in our mind. And Philippians 4, it says, the peace of God, which we can't understand, is going to guard our minds if we give in, if we think about such lovely and pure things, and then if we, as Paul says in Philippians 4, put it into practice. So what I'm doing right now is I'm merging Philippians 4, because when I read that, just like plainly, I kind of go, I don't really know what to do with that. That's absurd. So I'm, I'm putting together Romans and Philippians here, and I'm going, okay, the governance of the, uh, of the Spirit, um, it can, the Spirit can take governance from my mind. It can guard my mind, like it says in Philippians 4. And I believe there's a moment of volition, like it says in Romans, where we offer our body, where we present our life and body as living sacrifices. So, brothers and sisters, let him do the transforming and the renewing of your mind. The opening, the starting place is going, okay, here's my life. Here is my body. Here's my future. I commit to no longer... uh, Uh, conforming to the design of this world, but rather your design, my maker. And therein you can take my mind. You can renew it. You can transform it in the way you want. I don't push against you. Uh, You can have your way. My dreams, here they are. Here is my past and the framing of my past as I frame it in my present. Here's my sexuality. Here's my family. Here's my marriage. Here's my bitterness. Here's my fear. Here's my identity. Here it all is for you. I present it to you. I lay it at your feet. I declare you not just as divine, but as Lord. You can lord over me. This Sunday, too, govern me that I might become the kind of weirdo person whose mind and heart strangely loves to sing I hate and detest falsehood, but I love your law, as Psalm 119 puts it. Seven times a day I praise you for your righteous laws. Great peace have those who love your law, and nothing can make them stumble. I wait for your salvation, Lord, and I follow your commands. I obey your statutes, for I love them greatly. I obey your precepts and your statutes, for all my ways are known to you. For some of us, the spirit, like, it was automatic. It did everything. Like, when I was 16, I felt kind of like Neo in the Matrix, where it was like, it's just empty. Like, it's just not working for me. And I can hardly live another day in, in the universe if it is some voidly space. Jesus, like, I need you to, to be more real. Like, I need you to come in my life. And there was a simplicity to it. For others, it's like a rock bottom moment where the rock bottomness of your pattern of your life and the, and the, the conformity to the world, like it, it, you're like, it, it's not working. I literally have no other reason to live. I have no motivation. I need you, Jesus. And there's an automaticness. For others, it's just like being compelled by a collision with the Spirit of God. And you're, you, you feel a presence and, and you know, that's better than the world, so I choose the better thing. For others, specifically for like veteran Christians who are here, I would call you, I would challenge you, urge you to kind of like a bummer repentance. where you need to let the Spirit of God reign in your life by having a sad moment. Where you go, fine, you win. I give up on me. Like, I can't, I'm just over it. I'm over me. I agree to not live and behave in a way that is contrary to your spirit, and I'll do it for the rest of my life, fine. Like a floppy finality. Like, okay, I give up. I get used to it, I guess. And you might be sad, about that, 
and it's like not a good feeling. I, I think that some of us wait for like a compelled good feeling to repent. But for others of us, uh, it's not a happy good moment to stop procrastinating on living God's way. It's been like sleepwalking through life where you're constantly um, waiting to live and think how you should because the flesh, it's like a circle. The flesh leads back to itself. Like none of us here have like lived in a sinful mindset or sinned a bunch and got, gone against what we believe to be true and what we believe the Lord is calling us to. And then our flesh is like, you know, that really worked for me. That really worked for me to sin. And, and now I'm done and I'm totally satisfied. Right? When you feed the machinery of the flesh, it gets more hungry and more addicted. It's a circle. It leads back to itself. Some of us just need to adhere to the idea in our mind of, all right, I no longer get to do what I actually think is best. So the urging here is stop waiting until you feel like God's way is best. Because if you believe that God's way is best, maybe that is what the scaffolding with which you can approach and grab onto for this. Some of us need to have a moment where you go, okay, I'm grounded forever. Your design over mine. From this point forward, regardless of my feelings, because resisting actual temptation in our lives, resisting temptation and eating our own pride is actually a part of the Christian experience. It's not always joyful, and it might not be a one-time thing. But as it says in Psalm 51, the sacrifice you desire is a broken spirit. You will not reject a broken and repentant heart, O God. So if you have been uh, trying the strategy of like incrementally repenting over years, um, like working on yourself over time. Someday I'll get fully surrendered. Out there, someday. My advice is to you, my advice to you is to have like a sad give up moment where you go, "Cool, I'm just gonna tr- attempt to force it. I'll give in. Uh, it it might not feel good, but know that it might never ever feel good to give up your sin." Right, church? That might not ever be a good feeling if you're waiting for that to be a good feeling. But I will say, for many Christians, this is the place where real peace begins and freedom starts. Galatians 5, you, my brothers and sisters, you're called to be free. Do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. Jumping down to verse 24, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires, which doesn't sound awesome, right? To crucify your flesh. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Okay, you've been urged. Regardless of your feelings, repent based on what you believe and remain in surrender. Second, an email. This is a little bit nicer part because I didn't write it. The email is, again, from a person who I believe practices the gift of prophecy, who is a prayer warrior in our church, um, and this person is also in the, uh, works in the medical field, and uh, that does have something to do with her email when we get there. It says, hello, Jesse. I wanted to follow up on our conversation from Sunday regarding seeking the Lord and healing for the body of Christ at the three Mercy Hill locations. I would like to share some excerpts from Webster's Dictionary, Billy Graham's Sermon, and Charles Spurgeon's Sermon, Volume 1, and then a lot of numbers. Acts 17, uh, now God commands all men to repent. This is uh, Joel 2. So rend your heart and not your garments. Return to the, to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness, and he relents from doing harm. Billy Graham says to view sin as a failure of intimacy. The more glimpses we have of the glory of God, the more we mourn for, the scorning, for scorning that glory. Jesse, I believe there are many people at the Three Mercy Hill campuses who suffer from broken hearts and souls, which could have led to physical ailments, ongoing pain, and some chronic disease. There is a medical event called broken heart syndrome or stress-induced cardiomyopathy. Takotsubu, I think that's how you say it, cardiomyopathy, which results from experiencing a series of traumatic life circumstances. The syndrome occurs when a release of stress hormones causes short-term muscle failure. It is treatable but can be fatal. The good news is that 
He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. Psalm 147. Again, I'll say, this isn't like some banner cry that I'm super passionate about. This is me as an act of obedience, like passing this on because I felt like the Lord wanted some people to hear this. I don't really know about takotsubu cardiomyopathy or whatever it said. Uh, th- this is just, if it, re- if it resonates with you, cool. Uh, Webster's Dictionary describes binding as uh, to tie together, bandage, strengthen, to secure, and to tighten the bowels of. The following are passages of Spurgeon's sermon. Man, body, and soul, each portion of us can receive injury and hurt. The wounds of the body are extremely painful. And if the injuries amount to breaking the frame, it is singularly exquisite, more attentive to the serious wounds of the inner man. As deeply sensitive to spiritual injuries, we would cry, Beloved physician, and how soon we would prove his power to save. The stabbed most vital part of us from the hand of our original parent or disabled by our own sin. There is a balm, a physician who can heal all natural wounds, who can heal, who can give joy to the troubled countenance, take the furrow from the from the brow, wipe tears from the eyes, remove agitation from the bosom, and calm the heart now swelling with grief. Oh, I beseech him to come where thou art sitting. And put his hand inside my soul. And if he finds there is a broken heart to bind it up, see how he bows himself over the mangled heart. He always uses the softest liniment. He comes gently and sympathizingly. He does not use roughness with us, but with downy fingers. He putteth the wound together and layeth the plaster on. Yea, he doth it in such a soft and winning way that we are full of wonder to think he could be so kind to such an unworthy one. Maybe every week we should just read Charles Spurgeon instead of new sermons. This is Isaiah 1. Hear how he speaks. Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins are as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be as red as crimson, they shall be as wool. Third and lastly, I want to remind you of God's forgiveness today the nature of it. One reason that we do not repent is because we anthropomorphize God when we seek forgiveness, meaning uh, that we, when we imagine God's forgiveness in our mind, again, in our mind, this is why doctrine is so important. When we imagine God's forgiveness, we think of it as when we give it and when we receive it from other humans. I know that you don't think that you're like God, and I know um, that uh, God that you don't think God is like you, uh, but I'm saying all too often, somewhere in the back of our mind, we think God is going, when we go to him for, for forgiveness, we think God is going, yes, I'll forgive you, I guess, this time again, uh, but it's, it's a little bit disappointing because you had to ask for forgiveness again, you went into sin again, like how we do it. If your spouse or if you have a friend who sins against you, let's say 70 times, or maybe 70 times seven times, doesn't it eventually, even like, let's say for your life, like the fifth time, (laughs) doesn't it get a little bit awkward of an interaction? Like you start to be kind of skeptical. We say our marriages are totally Jesus, surrender, full-on sacrifice all the time. But, We do have little hidden economies, don't we? More than we like to admit. It's very much like, I promise to be who I should be if you are who you should be. Because we have a household. Everybody's got to pull their weight. Because we're reasonable, right? I'm not saying this is right. I'm saying this is how most of us live and think and do it. Or in a friendship. You don't really want to be friends with people that need, like, that much forgiveness in your life, right? Like, you want to be friends with people that need a little bit of forgiveness? Because no forgiveness, it's like they're too prideful. Come on, square with me here. Like, you don't, you're not, you don't actually seek out friendships and stay in friendships where it's like, well, you need, like, a lot of forgiveness, like a mountain of it. At worst, our forgiveness is flavored like, People come to us for forgiveness and we say, I forgive you. And then we go and vent to our friend about how, like, what that wrong that person did. 
I mean, we, I forgave them, but I'm mad at them. You know, like, I still have some emotions about it. I want to talk about it. The point is, we accidentally, sometimes subconsciously, apply all of this coloring and feel of what forgiveness is like to God when we go to him. And this can cause us to, uh, this can cause us to avoid going to him in the first place for forgiveness. And when this happens, it can keep us from repentance, from turning from the old way, and therein, it can keep us from walking in step with the Spirit. That can keep us from what all that the Spirit has for us, from what the Spirit wants to do in our lives. And then we might never become who God wants us to be, who God meant us to be in the first place, like the miracle of Philippians 4, because we have a skewed understanding of forgiveness, because we understand it in our mind more like a social forgiveness that we've done for other people and that we've received many times. But Christians, it's not. Can I preach for a moment? It is not a human social forgiveness. It's qualitatively different. It's fundamentally different. It's ancient. It's blood. It's atoning. It's sacrificial. It's covenantal. It's not human. It's obliterating forgiveness. Covenant. Modern secular society doesn't have a relationship category for this. God invites us into a relationship more, than, more intimate than legal, yet more binding than simply a personal relationship. A blend of law and love. A personal relationship made more loving because, and more intimate because it's legal. When we have covenant language, we have personal possessive pronouns, which is the language of love and intimacy. Example, we are his people, not a people. He is our God, not a God. If you heard me uh, talking about my wife like this, like, my Darren, she's just so, you'd be like, too much information, buddy. Get a room. It's so intimate, like that language of belongingness. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, David, Moses, always covenant. It's the way God has chosen to relate to us. There's no other way. Basically, the last thing Moses says to the Israelites before he dies is, make sure you stay in a covenant with God. The forgiveness of Jesus because of the work he accomplished on the cross allows this covenant to be in place and to work for you to belong to him. So if you have forgotten that truth, Choose to adhere in your mind, with your mind, to the reality that you are his. Recalibrate your mind to his truth. He hasn't forgotten. He hasn't forgotten. You can be his again in your heart, in your mind. It is his blood that began and keeps the covenant. Not how you think forgiveness should feel like when you go for it what you think it should look like. Maybe you're the strayed sheep and you're kind of just feeling like, I'm on my own, I don't know where I am. Where is my shepherd? Maybe you're the sheep that just like sat down and started eating a bunch of like religious grass and then you looked up and you're like, where did the shepherd go? Like I'm not walking in step with him anymore. It became... Like, just a belief. Like, what, how do, whatever it is, wherever you're at, whatever you lost, whatever you did, the blood of Jesus is such that you can regain all that was lost. Be his again. Take the helmet of salvation. The helmet of salvation around your head, around your mind. When Paul says that, he's talking to Christians. Take the helmet of salvation. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Acts 2. For some, this call to repent and to surrender um, because of where you're at, it's going to spur like a really uncomfortable kind of contrite forgiveness where you're like, I don't know how to or if I agree with God. That's okay. You can still give in if you believe he is Lord of your life. Our culture teaches us that our feelings are the compass of our life. And so, again, a lot of times we wait until our feelings line up with what we 
think in our mind our action is going to be. What I'm saying is crucify your flesh and your feelings. If you believe Jesus is Lord, it's, even if you don't want to, you can give in. I reject the lie of our culture that you need to wait until the compass of your feelings says so. I push against it. I deny it. For some of us, it's going to be an easy repentance. Uh, this kind of like call to recalibrate or whatever. It's, it's going to be like, yeah, I want to do that for sure. Sign me up. Like, I want to go get prayer with someone at the front. I want to eat communion right now. For some of us, it's like, you already know all this stuff, and you're one of those weirdo people that you're like, I know what God did, and the band is going to come up now, and I'm going to sing. It's going to be awesome. That's cool, too. I'm urging you towards repentance in these various ways. It can be whatever it is in your heart, whatever you're feeling, wherever you're at. That's okay. So what I want us to do now, saints of God, is to take communion, is to remember that his blood was shed for us, that his body was broken for us. And that's the nature and shape of communion. I'm going to invite the band up. We are going to sing together in praise. We're going to have like 15 to 20 minutes in this room because of how we've ordered the service uh, week to week. We're going to have a lot of time to process. There's communion up here at the front. I'm going to invite everyone who believes and declares Jesus as Lord if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, come take communion. Remember his forgiveness. Jesus says to remember it to his disciples, which we are. We get to remember it today and recalibrate in that way and remember that his forgiveness is available to us regardless of our feelings. Also, there are going to be uh, prayer team members. Uh, raise your hand if you're one of the prayer team members in here. We got one, two, three, at least four. Cool, awesome. Why don't you guys come up to the side here? Um, if it gets too loud, you can kind of scooch around the corners there. That's cool too. Uh, I want to encourage you, not only everyone here, to take communion and remember the work of the cross, but also um, you can just ask someone for more of the Spirit of God. Jesus frames and the apostles declare that there is power in prayer from a saint, from a fellow brother and sister in Christ. And prayer is part of the battlefield with which we can attack and defend. Prayer is very important. So this is something I pray for all the time. I just, and some of my coworkers might even think it's weird. I just go to them sometimes and I go, I just want more of the Spirit of God. Will you just pray for me? I just, I need more of the Spirit in my life. I, I feel a weakness. I want him to be strong in that weakness. You can pray for that. Isn't that cool that we get to do that? This week, monthly, Every year, whatever, every Sunday, we get to reframe and recalibrate our minds and our hearts in the Lord. Receive prayer and remember the work of the cross. And that's what we're going to do today. So let's everyone stand in this place together. And we're going to do that again today. Thanks be to God. Let's pray.